everybody. Help me welcome all of our first time guests here, both in the room as well as those of you online. So glad to have you guys worshiping with us. Man, weren't those baptisms awesome? I love celebrating. Yeah, come on. So nothing better. Matter of fact, we've been praying. Would you continue to pray with us that God fills every one of these empty seats with somebody who doesn't know him? Uh, that, that's my, my prayer for 2022. By the end of this year, uh, that, that there are no seats. There are no empty seats. So come on, join us in that. We'll get to see a lot of baptisms. Matter of fact, we'll do baptisms every week if we have to. Anybody with me on that one? Yeah. Woo, come on. Well, hey, we are starting a brand new series today. This is incredibly practical. <clears throat> it's something that applies to every one of us, uh, probably at every single moment of our lives, and, and it's just so, so important. And if you're wondering what in the world could be so important and so practical and apply to every single person all across the board, we're going to be talking about what comes out of our mouths. And I'm not referring to the burping sounds middle school boys make talking about the things we say. And so I'll just go ahead and tell you right now, if you are perfect in this area, if you never offend anyone, if you never say the wrong thing, if you never have to apologize, and if you are perfect in what you say, then you are free to go. Enjoy your lunch. Have a great day. Uh, actually, the Bible tells us if you're perfect in what you say, then you're actually perfect as a, as a person. So, so go ahead. Uh, you're free to go, and there are angels in the parking lot ready to take you to heaven. <laughs> But for those of you that are going to stay in the room, the reason this is such a big deal is because our words really are so, so important. And I think we've kind of lost what God intended for us to know about that. Matter of fact, uh, we all use our words so much to get into trouble. We've got phrases. I discovered a website dedicated to the list of phrases that we have to describe those of us who keep getting in trouble. Like this, has anyone ever told you you have a big fat mouth? Anybody in here you've been told you have a big fat mouth? Thank you for one or two honest people. How about motor mouth? You ever been told you have a motor mouth, anybody? <laughs> Don't raise your hand for the next one. You ever been told you have a potty mouth? Potty mouth? <laughs> How about this one? Anybody in here you ever put your foot in your mouth? There you go. That's like the number one phrase, put your foot in your mouth. Now, I got to tell you a funny story because uh, I, I do this as much as any of you, if not more than you. I was, uh, this was, took place a long, long time ago, just for the record, it was when I had just started teaching right after college, because I would never do such a thing today. <laughs> but anyway, we, we had been given a brand new building. It was really exciting to get to open a brand new school that hadn't been abused for like 50 or 100 years. And, and so we finished our first year, we go home for the summer and we come back and, and we're all excited for our second year and this brand new building and we also just got a brand new principal. And as I walked into the office, I wanted to, to go say hey to all of my friends that were, uh, you know, hadn't seen all summer long. And I walk into the office and our brand new building used to have carpet in the office. And somehow over the summer our carpet was gone and somebody who lacks decorating skills had decided that, that there should be like this teal green tile that didn't match up with anything else going down the halls in the other direction. The truth is it only matched toothpaste. Nothing but toothpaste did this thing match in the first place. And, and so I, I just felt the need to say what I was thinking as I walked into the office and looked down and went, what idiot did this? And a woman steps around the corner and says, this idiot. And that's how I met my new principal. <laughs> True story. Maybe some of you have been told you run your mouth. Anybody? Smart mouth. Anybody been told you have a smart mouth? Anybody been told you just mouth off too much, right? Look, I told you the whole website. We could keep going, but we won't. Uh, here's what you need to know if no one's ever told you. None of those are compliments. <laughs> None of them. Not even the smart mouth one. For those of you that were told smart mouth and you thought, oh, so I should keep talking and it eventually got you slapped. No, no, no. That's not the goal. So what we want to do for this series is just lay a foundation today. I want to lay a foundation on understanding how important our words are, or at least how important they should be. And so I've got a Bible verse for you we're going to start with. If, if you've ever wanted to memorize some, this, this should be on your short list. Like it should be in the top 10 of all the Bible verses you ever memorized. It's Proverbs 18, 21, and it says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. The truth is, this is kind of the theme for the series because what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks is talking about all of the ways that we bring life and death 
to ourselves, to the people around us, to our circumstances, to our environment. We're going to understand the power of our words. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. What that means is that those who love to use the power of their tongue, well, they're going to experience a lot of either life or death, right? And, and as we just keep saying, life and death. Doesn't that seem a little overdramatic to anybody? Life and death, you know, I mean, it seems a little serious. How in the world could our words possibly be so powerful? Well, to understand that, we have to go back to the beginning. So let me show you something. And it says in Genesis 1, the earth was without form and void. <laughs> when I said the beginning, y'all, I meant the beginning. We're going all the way back. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then if you continue in the creation story, God said, and then there was. God said something else, and then that was also. And God said, and then there was. It turns out that God's words, when God speaks, there's a creative force of life that is behind that. And God needed to do nothing except decree. Just simply by decreeing, it became. Is anybody in here familiar with Dr. Strange? Any Marvel fans in here? Dr. Strange? A couple of you, okay? The rest of you, you need to get saved. Oh, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> You get to make all the jokes you want in a message on speech because, anyway, back to my point. You see, Dr. Strange is able to create circles of light. They're, they're actually portals. But in order to do so, he has to have a sling ring, like jewelry on his hand. And he has to concentrate really, really hard. And he actually had to travel halfway around the world to learn how to focus his energy and go to some mystic school in order to create these circles of light. And what you need to know is that's not God. God simply says, and it is. It doesn't require going to a mystic school or any jewelry on his hand. God decrees and it becomes. He speaks and so it is. God's words have the power to create. God's words have the power to bring life. And God's words actually have the power to bring death. And then think about Jesus. When Jesus was in a boat and there was a storm on the water and his disciples were in the boat and they all began to freak out, Jesus spoke to calm the wind and the waves. He didn't and blow the waves away and then put his hand on the water for the water to calm down. He didn't have to do anything other than speak and the storm calmed down. How about when Lazarus was in the grave and Jesus went to, to raise Lazarus from the dead? He, he didn't move the stone and, and go into the tomb and, and, and shake Lazarus on the shoulder and say, wake up, sleepyhead. No, he didn't do any of that. He stood outside the cave and he spoke and Lazarus came forth obeying his words. Think about all the miracles Jesus did. Do you know that virtually every single miracle Jesus did was doing nothing other than speaking? Pick up your mat and walk. And he walked. Go home, your daughter's well. He went home and your daughter, his daughter was well. I mean, it, it's just how God is. So God's words have power. Jesus' words have power. The Bible tells us our words are supposed to have power. And if you're wondering, how did we get there? Well, it's the last thing that God does in creation. If we keep going with the story, it says, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Let us make man in our image. See, God rules and God creates. God gives life and God takes life all with the power of his words. And then God makes us in his image. God tells us to rule creation. Does anybody see a connection with what God's intent might have been for our words when God's Bible is the one that says life and death are in the power of the tongue? I think God takes his words very seriously, and he made us in our, in his image. He made us in his image. Think about this. God came to Mary through an angel and said, you are going to give birth to my son. And you know what Mary's response was? May it be as you have said. And so it was, and she was greatly rewarded. At about the same time, just a little earlier, an angel, God spoke through an angel to Zechariah and said, you're going to give birth, you, your wife, you, you and your wife are going to give birth to John the Baptist. And Zechariah's response to God's words were, how can I know it would be so? All I'm hearing are words. And if you'll allow me to paraphrase the Jimmy version of the Bible, the angel said, if you don't take God's word seriously, you don't get to use words at all. And Zechariah then did not speak until his son was born. I think God takes his words very seriously. I think God takes our words very seriously, and that means we're supposed to take our words very seriously. So I hope you can see so far that, that God made us with 
to be a, a bearer of his image and, and to carry power with our words. But I think every one of us here would say, y yeah, but I kind of, I don't do that. I, I, I haven't been able to raise the dead simply by what I say. You know, I haven't made anything. I, I, I haven't killed anything. Matter of fact, that, that conversation that you saw on the screen is, in, the, in the video is a real conversation. It, it, it's actually what I tried to do. I, I believe God gave me dominion. It's in the Bible. God gave me dominion over everything. And, and when flies annoy me, they're clearly demonic. That's just the only way that works. I mean, because, you know, I'm a child of God, and I don't need to be annoyed. And especially when I'm in my office working on my message, and a fly starts pestering me. That's got to be infused with a demon. That's just, I mean, that's what's happening, right? Because I am trying to prepare for you and, and to, to seek God's word, and there's this little buzzy thing that just comes all around. And I just keep thinking, God gave me authority, and, and I have, I just think I should be able to say, die in Jesus' name. That's not a joke. I've tried this. I've tried this. And the fly never dies. It's never died. And I, I'm, I'm serious. And all my theology and everything else, I'm just really wondering, okay, God, what's up? You gave me authority. Where's the disconnect? When a fly is tormenting me, I mean, I, I should be able to do something about this. I should have greater authority than a fly. Well, part of the problem might actually rest in something James tells us in chapter 3. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You see, what we have to realize is the power to our words doesn't come in the magic of your vocabulary. The power in our words comes from the God who empowers them. And so it's very, very possible that because our, our words are coming out of the same mouth that we're doing things we're not supposed to do and say, then therefore, maybe God's not empowering those words. Let, let, let me give you a little analogy here. I've got uh, this wonderful, it's called Dead Weed Brew that Pastor Eric brought me to share with you today. Dead Weed Brew. You put this on anything green in your yard that you don't want to be green any longer. This is, this is how you make sure it doesn't come back. Matter of fact, if you've got a really bad neighbor, uh, you can simply pour this over the fence. I'm totally kidding. Nobody do that. Okay, so would anybody like a, a little sip of dead weed brew? Okay, that's my son needs medical help <laughs> or mental help. We'll, we'll, we'll pursue that later uh, since nobody wants that. I do have, on the other hand, some fresh water. Did y'all just hear that click? It's, it's new, it's distilled, it's pure. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with this water. And the question now is, who would like a sip of water? <laughs> Teresa saying no? Maybe the same way that you say no thank you to that water simply because it's been in the same glass as poison, I think God says no thank you to some of our words because they've been coming out of the same mouth. And as we're going to see in a minute, God is paying attention to what we say, and some things get enforced and some things do not. And, and I think sometimes we, we need to be thankful that God doesn't enforce some of our words because we've learned to use them very flippantly. And so what I'd like to do is to give you uh, a, a way that you can maybe regain the creative and life-giving power of your words that God intended for you to have. And I could simply at this point say, take your words as seriously as God does. Have a nice day. But you know me, I, I like to, to be a little more practical. So what I'd like to do is give you a list of three very specific ways to take your words as seriously as God does. I think the, the list of three will help you a little bit more as we break down how to take our words as seriously as God does. And so if you're taking notes, this will be great because you're going to need this before you go to work and run your mouth on Monday morning. You're going to need to remind yourself of these three things for a little while. And number one is simply this. Mean what you say. Mean what you say. How many times do we say something, we get ourselves into trouble, and the solution to try to get out of trouble is to say, oh, you know I didn't mean that. Oh, don't take that so seriously. Oh, don't take it personally. I was just frustrated and venting. Oh, come on. How many times have we said we didn't mean what we said? But Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. 
Now, a lot of people at this point say, that, well, who cares, Jimmy? That's not that big a deal. It's on the day of judgment. So I get judged and forgiven and go to heaven all at the same time. It'll be a pretty short encounter. Who cares? Let me just keep on running my mouth. Have you noticed that it's not just on the day of judgment that we give account for what we say? There are marriages that are broken because of our careless words. There are friendships that are lost because of our careless words. There are all kinds of things broken in our lives because of our careless words. I think we should maybe not wait on the day of judgment to deal with that. Maybe sooner we should start thinking about how careless some of the things are that come out of our mouth. So first and foremost, actually mean what you say. And if you don't mean it, then don't say it. And later in the series, we'll talk about the fact that sometimes you do mean things and you still shouldn't say it, but that's why you got to come back for the rest of the series. At least right now, mean what you say. And the second one is this. Talk like God is listening, because he is. Talk like God is listening. I want to share with you one line out of a story in the Old Testament. Right, let me set the stage for you first. God's people have found themselves as slaves in the land of Egypt. And they had been there for 400 and something years. And, and it, it came time for the fulfillment of them to be set free. And, and it says that God had heard their cry. And so God, I'm ready to set you free. And I'm going to take you to this beautiful land that I have prepared for you. He had actually shown it to Abraham long ago. This is the promised land for your family, for generations, for my people upon the earth. It was supposed to be a land flowing with milk and honey, a beautiful land. But it required a short little trip across the desert. And so as God sets his people free from Egypt and they begin their little journey on vacation, they do exactly what people still do today when you put your kids in the car and go on vacation. Why are we going to go on this trip? I don't really want to go. My seat is not comfortable. It was much better at home. The Wi-Fi is better in my house. Can we just go back home? Why are we going to eat Burger King every time we stop anyway? <laughs> and they grumbled and they complained against God the whole way. And their grumbling and their complaining came up before the Lord. And you know what God says to them? So I tell them, so tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. And you're all leaning up on the edge of your seats to say, what did they say? And they said, man, if we had just died in Egypt, it would have been better. At the very least, just let us die right here in this wilderness. And if you're not familiar with the story and you've always wondered, why did it take them 40 years to get to the promised land when the journey was only a matter of weeks? It's because at this moment, God says, all right, I was listening. So here you go. And that was the moment he decreed that everyone that was whining and complaining and grumbling would get their wish. They would die right there in the wilderness. And for 40 years, they sat and they waited on God to fulfill their words. Talk like God is listening, because he is. Think about how many things you say that you hope God doesn't do. Think about how many times we say things like, I'll always be broke, and then you are. Well, this marriage will never work, and it seems to struggle. I won't get that job, and you don't. Look, we're going to talk later in the series about the things that we say about ourselves and on our lives and the things we pronounce over ourselves. But, but can we just go ahead and start with the principle? Talk like God is listening, because he is. And the third one will help you if you forget the first two. The third one is kind of a, a safeguard if you can't remember the whole list. Simply talk less. <laughs> just be quiet. Just, just talk less. Matter of fact, uh, I really should have uh, reminded you of one of the, uh, the verses in the Bible that, that would have been great to include here. I didn't even do it, but it won't be on the screen. I just want to share it with you. The, the Bible actually says even a fool is considered wise if he just shuts up. <laughs> like, just don't open your mouth and prove who you really are, man. Just be quiet. Talk less. Actually, another great Bible verse to memorize. I memorized this one in college. When words are many, sin is unavoidable. The, the version I memorized was when words are many, sin is not absent. If you run your mouth at some point, you're in trouble. Sin has come out of it. There's no other way. And the reason is a very simple concept. 
Because Jesus told us, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart. In other words, if you talk long enough, what's in here actually comes out. You know how we make the comment all the time about people like, man, that, that guy really needs a filter. Man, somebody just needs to help her. She just needs to learn to filter herself a little bit more. Well, here's the problem. Nobody's filter is that good. If you talk long enough, you're going to put a hole in the filter. It's, it, the real you is actually going to come out. Nobody can be Holy Spirit like all the time if you just run your mouth. At some point, you are going to let you come out. It, it just happens if you're in a conversation and you're just using a lot of words and you're talking using a lot of words and the conversation kind of goes boring and takes a lull and you realize, man, I've got this juicy piece of information I saw on Facebook and I could just spice up the whole conversation and gossip comes out and everybody loves you and the conversation is going again and lots of words are flowing or somebody comes to you and goes man i hate my boss oh i hate your boss too hey why don't we talk about it together this is wonderful and slander comes out and somebody says did you hear and say no i actually i heard and i saw this article and lies come out i mean it, it just we just keep talking if you talk enough if you talk enough the real you comes out matter of fact the truth is if you if you haven't noticed uh, i have notes and people have always asked, what is in my notes? I mean, I, I do this all the time. The and I don't look at them all that much. Uh, but my notes, I always tell people, my notes don't tell me what to say. My notes tell me what not to say. <laughs> That's true. I started learning as I, I began to preach. I realized I, I can talk. I got no problem running my mouth. I got a real problem making sure I don't put my foot in my mouth on stage in front of a whole lot of people. So my notes are, are carefully crafted, so I, I just tell myself when I'm up here, if it's not there, don't say it. If you haven't thought through it, you haven't run it by Kent, <laughs> just, just don't go there, right? So my notes tell me what not to say. So look, I, I, I want to, before I, I close, give what I think is just such an important warning or reminder. I, I think if I stopped at this point, uh, there would be a little misunderstanding or a lack of understanding about a really important concept when we run our mouths. And it's the concept of blessing and cursing. Blessing and cursing. See, blessing is when we speak positive thoughts, speak positive wishes, speak positively, period, towards someone or about someone. We're, we're wishing well for them. And cursing is when we are speaking ill will or something negative towards someone. I know a lot of people say, well, I don't curse because I don't cuss. But let me help you out. We got a little phrase we use here in the South. And that is, cussing is always a cursing, but cursing ain't always a cussing. Since half of our church is from Ohio, and, and my wife even didn't catch all of that one. Let me slow it down and do it again. Cussing is always a cursing, but cursing ain't always a cussing. What that means is anytime you're using four-letter words, you probably do mean ill will, but you can mean ill will without using four-letter words. You can look at somebody and say, I hate you. I hope you get what's coming to you. And you didn't use a four-letter word, but you did, you did just curse them. And, and so I am going to cuss in church, and everybody just take a deep breath. Because I need you to understand something. We say things like, damn it. And we typically say it when the key won't work in the doorknob. When the car won't start, when the, the, the power went out and you can't find out which breaker turns it back on and well, the list could keep going. And it's funny enough because at that moment we say those two words. And, and if you didn't know this, let me help you. The translation for damn it is not, oh, I am so frustrated. <laughs> the translation is condemn this. <laughs> God is listening, and you say, condemn this doorknob that does not work. Have you ever noticed it does not magically start working at that point? The power does not come back on. The blender does not come back to life. It's like those words are a surefire way to keep what's broken and frustrating you broken and frustrating you. <laughs> and if you add the word you at the end of that, with any four-letter word, you're saying condemn you or any other four-letter word you put to it. Now, here's the problem with blessing and cursing. We are blessed, forgiven, and loved. And God says we are blessed to be a blessing, not just in our generosity, and we could use that and talk about a whole lot of stuff, but one of them is also in our speech. We're blessed. God speaks blessing over us and intends for blessed people to speak blessing over others. 
God does not intend for someone who is blessed and loved and forgiven to speak ill will over others in his creation. And so, for some reason, those words seem to not get in force. Matter of fact, there's a Bible verse that helps us understand how this works. It's out of Psalm, and it says, He also loved cursing, so it came to him. And he did not delight in blessing, so it was far from him. Some of you have done this. I'll I'll tell them myself. Funny little story. You already know I like to drive fast, right? I like to drive fast, and I, I get irritated when somebody thinks they deserve to drive faster than me. And especially if they get in my way and kind of cut me off. And well, that happened one time. I'm driving down the interstate and somebody is trying to be more aggressive than me and they cut me off. And, and I just, just thought, I hope they get caught. And man, blue lights like came out of nowhere. I was like, yes, until I realized the blue lights weren't going after them. <laughs> you see, there's actually a principle in the Bible how an undeserved curse does not work. Or how if you try to get someone convicted of something and and it's not right, you get their punishment. See, God's got a greater principle at work. When we begin as blessed people to speak ill will on someone else, that that's very likely to be what we experience. So here's an idea for you. Speak blessing because it is likely to come back on you. And don't speak curses because they are likely to come back on you. Because the power of life and death is in the tongue. So I'd like to close with something that I felt God was challenging me with uh, just, just last month. Just a few weeks ago, I was, I was doing my one-year Bible reading, and, and I came across a passage, and, and I knew this series was coming up, and so one word jumped out at me in a way that it normally doesn't. Something I've read many, 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 many times, and and you've heard preached probably. I want to make very clear what I'm about to say to you is not a theological point that I've researched. It is simply one of those moments where you go, hmm, I wonder. Is it okay for me to share that kind of moment with you? So I was reading in Scripture, and Jesus was answering his disciples. He had sent them out to cast out demons and heal the sick and do all kinds of things. And, and they came back. There was one demon they couldn't cast out. They were really struggling with this, this one person. And they said, can you help us? And so, of course, Jesus does. And then he explains, and he kind of has this, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You guys have so little faith. And we know the story. Most likely, we've heard it preached in a sermon on faith. And every time I read it, I wonder, okay, where is my faith? But this time as I was reading it, I noticed faith is not the only ingredient in this story. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, go and it'll be gone. He didn't say, If you have faith, you can pray and the mountain will move. He didn't say if you have faith, you can think and the mountain will move. He didn't say if you have faith, you can touch it with your hand and it will crumble right before your eyes. He said if you have faith, you can say. And it made me wonder, are the mountains in my life that are not moving? Are they because I don't have enough faith? Or are they because too many of my words are being unenforced. Made me wonder. After all, we're made in the image of our God who has the life force, creative force to to bring about everything we see. And, And I can just see Jesus saying, hey, it's your father that put that mountain there simply by speaking and you're made in his image and and your word should be able to rearrange the furniture if you want because you're his child. You should carry the same authority. But your words just made me think, maybe I should reconsider. Am I taking my words as seriously as God intends for me to take my words? Mean what you say. Talk like God is listening. And if all else fails, just talk less. And I think that 
will at least be a good beginning, a good start to help us regain the creative force, the ability to speak life and death as God would have us do. Amen.